get ready. Uh, like I said earlier, not only your seatbelt, you need to put on your shoulder strap. Buckle up. Uh, let's pray. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much because you love us so much. And we just want to grow closer to you. And I just pray during this next teaching, you will open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts, uh, that we may know and understand you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I think I'll have a seat. All right. To me, this is going to be one of the most important sermons I've ever given from a prophetic point of view. Uh, let's begin here. Oh, uh, here. There we go. Look at Exodus 17, 16. God says, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And what does that mean? Every generation, there's going to be a war with Amalek. Now, I have underneath that, the king is coming. How many of you believe he's coming? How many of you are ready if he came? <laughs> That's the other thing. It's one thing uh, to be ready. It's another thing to know that he's coming. I, I love astronomy. I love looking at the sky. It's too bad we can't do more in Washington, but it's always cloudy. But in Psalms 19.1, it says, the heavens speak. The heavens have a voice. It says, they declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. I can't help at night to go out, you know, when it is sunny and it's a clear day, and you got a telescope and you can see the universes all around and everything. That is just mind-blowing to me. But the thing that's important to know, there's a big difference between biblical astronomy and astrology. I am not talking about astrology. Astrology tells everyone it's all about you. Astrology is about you. I don't care about me. I don't want to hear about me. I, I avoid astrology. But biblical astronomy, we have to know everything we possibly can. Look at Genesis 1.14. God said, let there be lights, that's the sun and the moon, to divide the day from the night and let them be for what? Signs. What signs do the sun and the moon make? Eclipses. Okay? The nice thing about these signs, when they come from heaven, it's a sign that can't be manipulated by a false prophet. It's a sign that is understood by every tribe, nation, and tongue and doesn't need a translation. Now, concerning uh, Genesis 1.14, I think that was the King James Version. How many of you have ever heard of the MBV Version? The Mark Miltz Version! Yay! <laughs> Here's how I believe it really should be translated. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for the divine appointments, for Sabbath days, for marking the Shemitah in the Jubilee years. That's what it is referring to. Well, if you want to look at a New Testament, uh, well, the other thing about these signs there for seasons, days, and years. Seasons is the Moedim, referring to divine appointments. The days refer to the holy days. The years refer to the Shemitah year, the Jubilee year. That's what we have to understand when he says that in Genesis 1.14. Concerning the last days, what does the New Testament say? Luke 21.25, there will be signs. Where? In the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity. Okay, why does God want to use the sun and the moons? Has the moon ever disobeyed God and said, no, I want to go this way? Has the sun ever disobeyed God and said, I want to go up and down? No. This is why in Psalm 89, 36 and 37, God says that David's seed will endure forever. His throne as the sun before me, it will be established forever as the moon. Because why? They are faithful witnesses for God. That's, what, that's why he calls on heaven and earth, sun and moon. Listen to what I'm saying. 
because they are God's faithful witnesses. How many of us know there was a sign in the heavens, in the stars, when Yeshua himself was even born? Okay, so I'm going to go through some slides here. I'm going to have to get up. I follow facts. I follow scripture. I follow science. Uh, that's what I follow, and I feel a lot more comfortable than just making up what I think is going to happen. But let me show you this. NASA is involved with science. They don't care about politics. They don't care about religion. It's just science. NASA eclipses are math, and they have 5,000 years of eclipses. That's a pretty good table to, you know, look at things. From 2000 B.C., all the way to 3000 AD. So that, we haven't even got anywhere near 3000 yet, but they can already tell you in advance when all the eclipses are. Now, there has been an equal amount of lunar solar eclipses pretty much. There's been all eclipses, 12,000 lunar and right at 12,000 solar. Does everybody see that? But that counts all the eclipses. As far as the lunar, there's penumbral partial total. As far as solar, you have partial, annular, total, and then a very rare bird called the hybrid. But when you look at the totals, uh, which is close to 4,000 and 12,000, you see an average of one total lunar eclipse every year and a half over 5,000 years. Just the total. The total lunar eclipses, not all of them, but a total lunar eclipse, you only average one every year, one and a half years. Same thing with solar. You only average one total solar eclipse every year and a half. So we're looking at a 5,000 year time frame, and you only get one total lunar eclipse every year and a half, and one total solar eclipse every year and a half. So I'm going to kind of tell you how all of this started for me back in 2008, 15 years ago, I loved astronomy and I went to NASA's website. Now think, this is back in 2008 and I see this, I wanted to see what was coming over the next decade from 2011 to 2020, because it's only 2008. And all of a sudden I look and I see, oh my goodness, there are four total lunar eclipses in a row. My goodness, look at that. Four. And these four are in a year and a half. Instead of having one in a year and a half, we've got four in a year and a half. Now, does that tell you the statistics are pretty rare that that would happen? But as you know, what do I always talk about? The biblical calendar. So I looked at these April, October, April, September, and I said, huh. I wonder when they fall on the biblical calendar. So I looked. The first one fell on Passover. The next one fell on Sukkot. The next one fell on Passover. The next one fell on Sukkot. And I'm going, do, 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 do. You know, you can only have a full moon in the, uh, a, a lunar eclipse in the middle of a month. You can only have a solar eclipse at the beginning of the month on the biblical calendar. So I, I put this together and I'm looking at this. Oh my goodness, in 2014 and in 2015, here we have these total lunar eclipses. So then I went to the solar eclipses and I found there's a total solar eclipse on Nissan 1, the beginning of the religious calendar. And there also is a solar eclipse on Rosh Hashanah. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, not only we have lunar, we also have solar eclipses. We got four in a row and I'm racking my brain. So what does it mean? I know God is trying to tell us something, but what is he trying to tell us? At the time, I didn't know. And when I wrote my book in 2014, I finally wrote my book about seven years later, uh, and I told everybody, hey, if you can figure it out, let me know. I don't claim to know it all. I just report what I see and I say, everybody, let me know. But what I did after I saw this, what would be the next question in your mind? Has it ever happened before? So I go back to look, when was the last time? See, I know the solar lunar eclipses have to do with Israel. That's what, they're four signs. The last time we had four total lunar eclipses in a row was 1967 and 68 when Israel captured Jerusalem. And I'm rocking in my seat. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, when did it happen before that? 
when Israel becomes a nation. I was like, okay, hey, this something is going on here that to have four in a row, you know, and then when was the time before that? 1492, when all the Jews got kicked out of Spain. And now I'm just, you know, it's like I want to go to Vegas and find out what are the odds of all of this happening. And I start thinking about it. What are the odds of having four total lunar eclipses in a year and a half? Not only that, they're in a row with no other eclipse, and they fall on Passover and Sukkot, and their significance events that happened to the Jewish people on those dates, and it's a repeating event in history. Do you see how the odds are getting off the chart? But wait, there's more. Then I went to the solar eclipses to see that the solar eclipses were fascinating. How do you know something big happened in Israel in 70 AD? What happened in 70 AD? Well, let's go see if there were any lunar or solar eclipses. What do we find? Oh my gosh, during 69, 70, 71 AD, there was solar lunar eclipses on Sukkot, Nisa 1, Passover, the ninth of Av, the temple was destroyed, and then we have more on Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Purim, Nisa 1, Rosh Hashanah. I mean, the odds are astronomical to have solar and lunar eclipses all occurring on significant days in Jewish history when things happen. But get a load of this. Those hybrid solar eclipses I talked to you about only happen once every 10 years. And here we have two within six months. On Nisan 1, the beginning of the religious calendar, Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the civil calendar. Uh, how many of you think that the odds are too astronomical? I mean, this is off the chart. So this is what I saw back in 2008, and so I, I finally wrote a book about it in 2014-15. And uh, there's more coming, guys, that I'm going to have to tell you about next week. But right now, I'm going to kind of set the stage and show you what this basically means. Here, the last Jubilee cycle was 1973 to 2023, 20, but it really uh, isn't the Gregorian calendar years, but that's basically what it was. But no, I want to, to kind of put a parenthesis around this last Jubilee year and think about it. The year of Jubilee is proclaimed on Yom Kippur. October 6, 1973 was Yom Kippur. And that's when the Yom Kippur War happened. So the Jubilee year is marked off on the very first day with a major war. Then, 50 years later, what happens? And look, it goes from October 6th to October 7th. I think that's fascinating. 50 years later, the very last day, there's a war in Israel. So to have the Jubilee year bracketed with war and war, the very first day, the very last day, was interesting to me. Because I discovered this in 2008, which was a Shemitah year, and it was on a Shabbat, and it was the 15th of Av that I taught what the Lord was showing me. Well, guess what? Those total solar lunar eclipses was also in a Shemitah year, seven years later. So I saw it in a Shemitah year. Seven years later are the eclipses, and seven years later comes the end of the Jubilee and a war. So I'm looking for patterns. So I go back to 73. We look at the Jubilee cycle before that, and guess what? The other total solar eclipses were in 67 and 68, which was a speedy year, and exactly seven years, a speedy year cycle before the war in 73. I mean, this is just too crazy. And not only that, there was the 67 six day war. So looking at the odds, what are the odds? that you have the solar lunar eclipses in a Shemitah year occurring seven years before the beginning and seven years before the end of a Jubilee cycle and they both begin and end with wars. So here is the next Jubilee cycle. Here's seven times seven is 49 years. We just ended a Jubilee cycle, so you are here. You're at the beginning of a new Shemitah cycle and a new Jubilee cycle. So you can see how all of this is interesting, but there's chaos. And as in Genesis, everything was utter chaos. 
okay, before the Spirit hovered across the waters. Well, we are in that same period right now of utter chaos. Now, the seventh millennial day has begun because like I told you in the last week, it's always on sunset of the sixth day, the seventh day begins and we are there now. So with that said, I wanna talk a little bit about solar lunar eclipses. Let's see. Where do I want to go? Okay. How many total solar eclipses have been over the United States since we became a nation in 1776? Anybody know? I will tell you. Eight. Here's when they occurred. We had two in the 1700s. 80 years later, we had three in the 1800s. 92 years later, we had two in the 1900s. We're now in the year two th the millennium or whatever, 2000 or the century. If you see, there's only seven there. When was the eighth one? It's in this century. 38 years later, on August 21st, which was the great American eclipse that went from Oregon all the way down through the Carolinas. Everyone remember that? Okay, here's what's significant. That was the eighth one, and eight always speaks of new beginnings. Okay, it's the first year of a new Shemitah cycle, and the ninth year would be the second year. But get a load of this. Solar eclipses always refer to the nations, judgment on a nation. A lunar eclipse always refers to judgment toward Israel. This is a solar eclipse, and it is the very first total solar eclipse ecl exclusively to the United States since before the nation's founding in 1776. The one that happened in 2017 was the one and only in our history total solar eclipse that only hit the United States. It didn't hit Mexico. It didn't hit Canada. We were the only country. What that means, God put a target on our nation. We're going to be judged. Now, watch this. April 8th of 2024, this next spring, is the ninth solar eclipse to go over America. Now, let's go back and uh, also realize April 8th is Nissan 1, which is very significant. So let's look at patterns. The two solar eclipses that happened in the 1700s, what was going on at that time? The Revolutionary War. The three Solar eclipses that happened in the 1800s, what was going on? The American Civil War. During the 70s, what was going on? The Vietnam War. Okay, so August 21st, 2017, which is exactly seven years before this one in April, will there be war? That's been the pattern. But the next one isn't until 2044, the next solar eclipse. So I really believe that... We're ahead of for interesting times because this is the ninth eclipse and nine is the last of the single digits and thus marks the end. It's significant of the conclusion of a matter. It's the number of finality or judgment. And it looks like war. Okay, <clears throat> let's go back to our notes a minute. I'm going to put this up on the screen too. Numbers one, we're going to look at verses one through three. They're done traveling or sitting at the mountain for a year. They're, it's time to go to war and get the promised land. Numbers 1, 1 through 3, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, on the first day of the second month. Whenever you're reading the Bible and you hear the first day of the month, you think of new moon. There's always a new moon on the first month. You also think of blowing the shofar. Because they blow the shofar on the new moon, but they also, also blow the shofar when they're about to go to war. Both are happening at this time. In the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go what? To war. All that are able to go to war in Israel, you shall number them by their armies. If you're going to go to war, you better get organized. And so that's what God is doing. He's got them all organized. Now, the second month, it says, we know it's a new moon, 
What month is the second month on the biblical calendar? Somebody, what's the second month called? What's the first month? Nisan, that's when Passover is. What's the second month? I'll help you. Yes, E-R, not Eeyore, he's a donkey. This is E-R, and uh, the thing about the second month of E-R, how many of you know we're supposed to know the times and seasons, right? Well, if you don't know the biblical months, how can you know the times or seasons? If you don't know, E-R is a month for war biblically. If you don't know, you don't know that E-R is a month of war, you're not going to be prepared for war. But that's what E-R speaks of. That's why we see in Numbers 1, it's the first day of the second month, God says, get ready for war. Now, look at Numbers 10. Numbers 10 goes parallel with Numbers 1. And Numbers 10, 9 says, when you go to war in your land against the adversary that oppresses you, you're to sound an alarm at the trumpets, and you're to be remembered for the Lord your God, and you'll be safe from your enemies. So now what God does, he gives them their marching orders to go to the war. We see in Numbers 10, 14 through 16, he goes, in the first place is the camp of Judah. And then the second place is Issachar. And then comes Zebulun. And if you'll notice, all three of these are on the east. Judah went first, Issachar is second, Zebulun is third, because Judah is the captain of the east side. Reuben is the captain of the south side. So after those three, he leads the way as four, Simeon is five, Gad is six. Then on the west, Ephraim is next because he's the captain of the west side, and Dan is the captain of the north. So you can see the numbers of how they traveled, okay? Well, here's the other thing. There are not only 12 tribes, there are 12 months in a year. So Judah went first, and Nisan is the first month. So Judah is tied to the month of Nisan. Issachar would be Eyar. Zebulun would be Savon as you go around. But here's what's interesting. Most people don't know the east and the south are all Leah's family. And the west and the north are all Rachel's family. And so you have Leah who ends up... Uh, uh, Gad is the sixth. Now, Gad is Zilpah, Leah's handmaid. And the sixth month is the month of Elul. So the first six months, the first is Judah, the last is Gad. Then Ephraim is the month of Tishri, the seventh month. Has to do with Rachel. And it goes all over to Naphtali, and that's the month of Adar, the twelfth month. And Naphtali is Bilhah's uh, kid, who was Rachel's handmaid. So... From beginning first to last, Nisan, the baton in traveling goes all the way to Gad. Gad, all of these are Leah's family. Gad passes it off to Ephraim, who passes it off to the last, which is Naphtali, and all of those are Rachel's kids. And then Naphtali passes it off to Judah again, uh, and it just goes round and round. Okay, let's see. Okay, while it's thinking... Oh, so remember, we have uh, Judah, Gad, Ephraim, and Naphtali. But look at this. Look at Numbers 2, 2 and 3. The children of Israel are to put up their tents in the order of their families by the flags or banners. Okay? And those whose tents are on the east side looking toward the sunrise will be around the flag of Judah because Judah is the head. But they all traveled according to their flags. Now, look at Exodus 17, 15, 16. I'm gonna th I already gave you 16. I'm going to throw in 15 now. It says how Moses built an altar, and he called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. What does Nisi mean? Jehovah Nisi. The Lord of the banners. And so he's the Lord over all the flags or all of the tribes of Israel. And you see in Numbers to nine, the armies of Judah went first. 
Then the armies of Reuben went second. And that's referring to the entire south side. And then uh, Numbers 224, the armies of Ephraim. Numbers 231, the armies of the tents of Dan. They go forward last by their flags. But notice, it's all by their armies. They're going to war. So here we see Judah goes first. And the last is Gad of the first six. And then Ephraim goes first, followed by Naphtali. Now, when you think of east to west, we're going from Passover to Rosh Hashanah. Okay, very significant. Now, watch this concerning an army with flags. In the Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 10, it says the daughters of Jerusalem are speaking to the, about the bride. And she says, who is she that looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? This is referring to the tribes of Israel. But look at verse 13. It goes on and it says, return, return, O Shulamite. That's as if she's gone. Just like when the resurrection of the dead takes place, we're gone. And this is saying, return, return, O Shulamite, that we may look upon you. And then she says, what are you going to see in the Shulamite? And they say, as it were, the company of two armies. It's not just the physical army. It's the heavenly army, the spiritual army. For example, I'm going to bring up some mulberry trees here. And let's look at 2 Samuel 5, 22 through 25. The Philistines, and where did the Philistines live? The Gaza Strip. It says the Philistines came up again, spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim, and David inquired of the Lord, and he said, don't go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come up over them against the mulberry trees. And let it be when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then get going uh, for that's when the Lord will go out before you to smite the host of the Philistines. So we see a spiritual army running across the top of the mulberry trees, and then the physical army knows that's when they are to move. And they did it, and they smote the host of the Philistines. Well, guess what? The time of the mulberry trees is April, springtime. Again, ER, March, April. This is the time of war, and that's when this is happening in the time of war. Now, I remember Daniel having a great vision. Remember Daniel? He had several visions. One of them is a statue of all the countries. But another one, it says he has been praying and fasting for three whole weeks. And then this angel appears and says, man, I heard you from the get-go, but I couldn't get to you for three weeks. Do you ever want to remember that story? What month of the biblical calendar was that happening in? What month was Daniel fasting and praying for three whole weeks? Let's take a look and see. Here we go. Look at Daniel 10.1. It was in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Iran. A word was revealed to Daniel, and the word was true even of great warfare. And he gave heed to the word, and he understood the vision. Okay? And then, in Daniel 10, 2, and 3, I was mourning three whole weeks. I didn't eat any pleasant bread. Neither did no food or wine come in my mouth. Neither did I order myself for three whole weeks. And then in verse 4 and 5, it says, On the 24th day of the first month, I was by the river Tigris. I lifted my eyes, and behold, this angel appears before him. Okay, the 24th day of the first month. What's the first month? Nisan. So here we are in Nisan. The new moon marks the first of Nisan. I have 2024 because this year lines up exactly like the biblical calendar. So Daniel, if it ended on the 24th, it begins on the uh, for, uh, third of Nisan. So he's, he doesn't, there is no Passover. The temple's destroyed. He's over in Babylon, but he's fasting and praying during that time. Well, it so happens this next April, there's a total solar eclipse I'm telling you about on the first of Nisan. 
On the third, the angel appears, or he doesn't appear. There's an angel that's doing battle every day against the king of Persia for three whole weeks. And of course, this is going to be Passover this next year, which is when this comet appears. And then again, the angel is battling in Iran for three whole weeks. He finally appears to him and he says, look right here, 12 through 14. He said to me, don't fear, Daniel. From the very first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And, I become, and I've come because of your words. But look what it says. The prince of the kingdom of Iran withstood me these 21 days. But Michael came to help me. And so I'm able to come to you. And then look at this. He says, I was left over there beside the kings of Persia. Now I'm come to make you understand what will befall your people in the last days. That vision that he received was for us. Okay? And it happened in Nisan. And he says, now I have to go back and continue to fight the prince of Persia. This whole battle against Persia, Iran, is in the month of Nisan, okay? Er is a month of war, as well as Nisan. Nisan is when the Lord died. You don't think there was a big battle going on when he died in heaven, okay? Well, Er is the big battle before that. The devil starts the battle a little bit early. Now, look at this. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, when is this supposed to be over? Two? Okay. I had to quit the first group at this time because I had to have the kids come up. So I'm going to give you a little extra to them. And then I'll have to pick it up next week. This is, what do you think so far? It's kind of interesting. Now, you remember the story of the mulberry tree? <coughs> okay. <coughs> Daniel 1020 <coughs> on your notes. <coughs> <coughs> okay. <coughs> the angel. The angel. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> he says, Do you know why I even came to you? <coughs> and then he says, I'm gonna return to fight with the prince of Persia. <clears throat> and this is talking about the last days, right? Did everybody see that? You know what happened in the latter days. I can't help but think, and I just now saw this. I, I'd never seen this before till right now. Good thing I have a little coughing fit. <clears throat> he says, Yeshua says, I'm going to return. When does he return? When it's time to fight with the prince of Persia. Do you catch that? This is the Messiah who says, when I return, I'm going to return. This is talking about the second coming. And he's going to fight with Amalek. Amalek is Persia. And he says, I'll have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I believe this is the terminal generation when Amalek will be defeated. And it's going to start next year. It's going to start next year. Look at, I have two verses that aren't on your notes. You can just write down. They're both in Isaiah 24. I'm going to read 19 through 20 and then 21 through 23. Now tell me if this doesn't sound like the end times. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moving exceedingly. The earth is going to reel to and fro like a drunkard. It'll remove like a cottage. And the transgression thereof will be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. That's why he's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And then look at verse 21 through 23. It says, it'll come to pass in that day that the Lord is going to punish the army or the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. In other words, there's a war in heaven that is going on at the same time there's a war on earth. Remember, Satan's going to be cast down, okay? And it says, 
and they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit and be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. That's the thousand-year millennial reign. Then the moon will be confounded, the sun is shamed, when the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his agents gloriously. That's the, this is the millennial reign. Okay, so, <clears throat> let's see. Let's start, look at First Chronicles 20, verse 1. It says, now, when? What season? The spring. It says, in the spring, and what happens in the spring? This is the time when kings go out to war. March, April, May. And Joab, now Joab, who knows who Joab was? That was King David's general for his army. And it says, when the kings go out to war, Joab went out at the head of the armed forces. See, war takes place in the spring. He made waste all the land of the Ammonites. Ammon Jordan is the head of the Ammonites, still is to this day. And put his men in position before Rabbah, shutting it in. But look at this. But David was still at Jerusalem. And Joab took Rabbah and made it waste. Now, Let me show you this. Here we go. Springtime. I want to remind you, the entire vision of Daniel was to be for our days. That's what it said. And when does the vision of warfare take place in the end of days? During the month of Nisan, which is when Passover is. This is a war with Amalek or Iran. Now, do you remember what month was the first month that Amalek attacked. What was the event? If you don't remember the month, what was the event? Anyone remember the first time Amalek attacked? The first time was the second month, Eyar. They've left Egypt, and they're trying to go across, and Amalek attacked the weak and the elderly. When was the next time we hear of a big story of a war with Amalek? Okay, this... The first time refers to the Exodus. The second time refers to the book of Esther. The second time he attacked was in the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. What is in between the 12th month and the second month? The first month. And the third time and the final time of Amalek attacks when Yeshua returns is the first month, which is Nisan. Okay, this is, uh, I think of it this way. Esther took place in March and April. Nisan is March, April, May. And Er can be in April or May. So that basically gives you an idea. But the main thing is the war is in the spring. That's when the kings go to war. So think of bookends. Amalek attacked the second month, the first time. Then the twelfth month. And this next time we see the war with Amalek is going to be in the first month, which is the month of Nisan. Okay, now going back to our verse, <clears throat> who was the God of the Ammonites? Who? Nope, not Baal. Who did the Ammonites and the Moabites both worship? Molech. They would offer their children to the fire, kind of like abortion or whatever. If you remember, the Messiah came the first time in the form of Moses at the Exodus, and they were killing all the babies. The second time was when Messiah came, and they were killing all the babies. And here we are the third time, and what are they doing? They're killing all the babies. Okay, so Milcom is a horrible god. Solomon, King Solomon was the first one to sacrifice his firstborn. It's in the Bible. To Molech. And now this is who... Israel is attacking. Joab is the head of the army. He whips up on them and beats the bejeebies out of them. Okay, and look what happens. We just got done reading that David was where? Yeah, 
But now, why? Anybody know why David waited? David did go. Why did he wait? I will show you. Joab celebrates. What does he do? Joab takes the crown of the god Molech and puts it on his head. So here, Joab the general has the crown of the pagan god Molech on his head, and he's walking around. And David comes. And what do you think David does? It says, 1 Chronicles 22, David takes the crown of Milcom from off his head. Its weight was a talent of gold. It had stones of great price, and David put it on his own head. Now David has the crown of a pagan god on his head, and he took a great store of goods from the town. And then in 1 Chronicles 20, it says, then David and all the people went back to Jerusalem. He's got a pagan god on his head. Why was he still in Jerusalem? Well, let's go look what 2 Samuel 11 1 says about this same time. In the spring, at the time when the kings go to war, David sent Joab and his servants and all of Israel, all of Israel, everybody's gone. And they made waste of the land of the children of Ammon and took up their position before Rabbah, shutting it in. But David, what? Tarried. There's a difference between saying David was still at Jerusalem and saying David tarried when everyone's laughed. Why? He's eyeballing Bathsheba taking a shower. That's where David's mind was. Everybody's gone. Look at 2 Samuel 11, 2. Here it is the same time when it's time to go to war and David is having an internal war. It came to pass in that even time, David arose from off his bed, walked upon the roof of the king's house. In the roof, he saw a woman watching herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. The reason he, he, he tarried, but because he tarried when everyone else left, now comes the whole problem with Bathsheba. He's having all kinds of moral problems, which is why he ends up putting the crown of the god Milcom on his head. But I'm just telling you, the purpose of this, each and every one of us are going to be going through a war, not only externally, but internally, and we have to conquer our demons inside. The battle is coming. I'm letting you know in advance. <clears throat> and then, let's go. We're in 1 Chronicles 20 from the other time when I talked about the kings go to war, but I want you to look at this. Verse 4a, after this, there was another war with the Philistines. Verse 5, and again, another war with the Philistines. Verse 6, and then there was a war with Gath. This whole month, springtime, March, April, May, is a month for wars. This is how you have to understand the times and the seasons the spring season is a time of warfare, internal and external. As a matter of fact, remember Balaam spoke uh, to Balak, the king of the Moabites? Listen to what he says in Numbers 24, 14. And now behold, I'm going to my people. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people when. In the latter days, he's talking about now. And in Numbers 24, the next verses, 17 through 20, what does Balaam say? I shall see him, oh, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There will come a star out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And look what he's going to do. He's going to smite the corners of Moab. He's going to destroy all the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession. Say, heir also will be a possession for his enemies. Israel will do valiantly, and out of Jacob will come he that will have dominion, destroy him that remains in the city, and then look. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up this parable, and he said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end also will be that he perishes forever. And if you remember in Psalm 83, the tabernacles of Edom and Moab and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines, all of these are the ones who's going to be destroyed. And I'll stop there and I'll give you the rest of this notes. Bring your notes back. I'll have them for you next week. But do you see what's going on? Do you understand the times and the seasons better and why we need to know the seasons? All right. With that said, let's stand.